institutions are the rules of the game that regulate how we play with each other when we interact in the economy. If we don't understand how institutions work, we can't possibly understand how economies change and how economies can grow and develop and eradicate poverty. I've spent my life studying inequality, that is how the pie is divided up between the people with competing claims on the pie. Institutions are a part of that process because it determines, for example, who's cutting the pie, uh, who's making the terms, who's writing the contracts, who's enforcing them. But they also determine who's going to get the power, who's going to get the wealth, and the process by which that takes place. And that's what this project is trying to discover so that we can actually transform our institutions, not only so that they're more fair, but also so that they encourage the process of exploiting mutual gains for the benefit of all. Politics is the key to understanding inequality. If you look across nations, we're not so different in how much inequality we have in our assets and our skills. The main difference between, say, a country like Germany or Norway and on the one hand and a country like the United States on the other is a political decision in the case of the Northern European countries to redistribute a very substantial fraction of their income so as to have a more uh, equal distribution of living standards. And that decision has not been made in other countries, for example, the UK and the United States. One of the things we don't know in the study of inequality is why societies differ so much in how they handle the problem of justice and unfairness in their economic game. Among the developing countries, for example, we have stellar uh, countries which actually ensure a lot of goods and security to the least well-off. For example, like Costa Rica, uh, like, for example, the Indian state of Kerala. In other countries, it's pretty much fend for yourself. The poor really don't have a chance and their children are also consigned to poverty by poor education and by the fact that they inherit the same low levels of wealth and the debts of their parents. In many societies, wealth is just inherited. So for example, in societies of yesteryear, if you had a lot of cattle, your sons inherited a lot of cattle. That's not a matter of uh, necessity or of nature. In Madagascar, there are people called the Tandroi. They're also herders, and sometimes a few of the tandroi accumulate a very large number of cattle. And when one of the elders dies, as is often the case, there is a ceremony and a feast. They eat the cattle of the uh, deceased. The feast goes on until all of the cattle have been consumed, for months if necessary. Now what, is, what does it mean? The tandroi people in Madagascar have adopted a practice which says, we're going to start afresh, every generation. Inequality, we've now learned, is sand in the gears. It's slowing the economic system down. Who's benefiting from the economic game depends primarily on the institutions which are regulating the game. Understanding those institutions and changing them in the direction of fairness and in the direction of economic progress would be a huge contribution to human welfare, particularly for the least well-off. This can only be done if we reorient the public's thinking about economics so that it understands that interventions by the government on behalf of fairness can also at the same time be interventions on behalf of progress. And that's the way an economy can work if we give up the old idea that moving towards a more equal society will necessarily bear a heavy price in terms of economic progress.